Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Murphy, and welcome to an R&D election dialogue, or election R&D dialogue. We're doing a clever pun thing there with both research and, of course, Republican Democrat. I'm uh, here on behalf of the USC Center for the Political Future, of which I'm co-director. With us is our director and my good friend, if professional opponent, Bob Shrum, and our special guest here, somebody we're very, very, very lucky to have as an upcoming fellow, former state California state treasurer and state controller, John Chung. So what we're going to do is talk a little bit about fiscal politics. We're going to talk about the presidential race. We're going to talk about what it's like to be an elected official in a mega state like California. And we're going to be taking your questions. Now, before we begin, I want to just put in a little plug because John is going to be doing a seminar here at the USC Center for the Political Future, which is fascinating stuff and hugely relevant now. The name of it is From Financial Crisis to COVID-19, California Policy Responses to the Fiscal Failout. So if you dig state fiscal policy, and like me, you have a passion for accounting standards and other important stuff that may feel like Arcania, but is actually the, the, the heartbeat of, uh, of how a state budget runs and what programs get funded and what doesn't and what the political fight is over, you can get a real master class education from somebody who's been there, which of course is our guest today, John Chunk. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my uh, partner in USC politics, Center Director Bob Shrum. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and thank you, John, for being here. Uh, John Chung was uh, state controller of California, state treasurer of California, and is universally regarded as one of the most capable and thoughtful statewide officials California has had in the last several generations. Uh, we're, we're very lucky to have him as a fellow at USC. I'm going to ask him a little bit about his background in a few minutes, but I'd like to start with the crisis we're in the middle of, uh, and that's the COVID crisis. It looked like California had this under control. Uh, suddenly, we've had a surge. The surge shows no sign of abating. Uh, Governor Newsom has just shut down much of the state again. And we may be on the verge of a total lockdown if this doesn't stop. So I'd like to ask John what he thinks of the job that the state and the county and here in Los Angeles have done. And what do you make of this idea that Republicans, some Republicans have put out, that they might try to recall Governor Newsom because he's closing down bars, hair salons, gyms, et cetera. Well, Bob and Mike, it's an honor to join you. And a shout out to uh, Harry, who's helped with the onboarding process, and Erica, who set this up. Uh, to your point, to your question, uh, wait, the question is, what's the benchmark? So if you look at the actions of President Trump, when you look at the actions this week of Governor Georgia Brian Kemp, uh, where he just implemented uh, action to prohibit local governments from imposing difficult standards, uh, Governor Newsom uh, has shined well above them. Right? When you think about the early action, uh, what he did well is he followed. He looked at the action of the local, regional, Northern California governments. They understood what took place in, during the HIV crisis. They followed a lot of the recommendations by UC San Francisco, and they started the stay-at-home home orders. He took that statewide. Secondly, I think he made a proper adaptation, uh, right? The, especially if you're a partisan Democrat, you know, you like disagreeing and taking shots at President Trump, uh, in many cases, rightfully so. Uh, right? Governor Newsom was talking us being a nation state. We are a nation state, but without many of the fundamental, especially financial tools. So we are heavily dependent on the actions of President Trump and the federal government. So the fact that he toned that down uh, to not get on the wrong side because you know, California's success is gonna be heavily dependent on uh, Nancy Pelosi remaining speaker, right? The, hopefully for me, uh, right, the, and hopefully for a lot of Californians, if you want support for California, especially state and municipal governments, uh, we're gonna need people that are more sensitive uh, to local government support because we know that if local governments start losing jobs, state governments start losing jobs, we're gonna add to the re recessionary pressures. How do you think a recall uh, effort against uh, Gavin Newsom would go? I think I think it's totally unconstructive. The uh, right, the you know, if you're a Republican, if you're some of the others, right, right, you know, think, you know, contribute some solutions. You may disagree with our our governor. Uh, I believe he's earnest about trying to come up with some solutions. They're not going to be perfect. Uh, one of the things that I think all of us need to do better 
America applies national standards. We ought to be looking at international standards. What has made America great uh, is that other people have modeled us, right? Every time I travel throughout the world, Israel, China, Taiwan, uh, Jordan, the Egypt, right? They look at the Silicon Valley. They look at other aspects. They try to model our best practices. Uh, we came to this later. It's like, why aren't we learning from Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Germany, Iceland, right? We, we have been a little slow in our response uh, and that has hurt us. Uh, I wanna ask a question that's related to COVID uh, and that I think goes to one of Mike's favorite topics. Uh, COVID has highlighted the weaknesses in California state pension system as we enter what looks like a budget crisis. But aren't there fundamental underlying problems and is it politically and substantively possible to actually achieve pension reform? Yeah, obviously it's gonna be very challenging. The, uh, yeah, the, the market is artificially high. The, we know that the federal government, not federal government, I'm sorry, the Fed uh, intervened. And so what they call it is, and I'm sorry to get a little wonky, right? They, they start to call it the Fed put when they start pr uh, purchasing some assets to make sure that we didn't have a financial crisis uh, in the markets, right? So it's holding up, but we know the valuations are high. If you look at CalPERS, the nation's largest public defined benefit plan, CalSTRS, the state teacher's retirement system is second largest, uh, right? They were both below 70% funded prior to uh, COVID-19 and its impact. Uh, what, what's gonna have to take place is like, we're gonna have to look at perhaps for some of the jurisdictions that are in deeper trouble, uh, what they're gonna do in regards to amortization, right? And this is where I hate getting too wonky the, with the general <laughs> audience, right? They may have to look for a refresh and a new start uh, in paying this. But part of this is if we're gonna fix this, we need leadership uh, from the employees and their representatives and the government officials to identify what's realistic. Because at, at the heart of this and how much we have to pay depends on the negotiations at the bargaining table and what's realistic. We don't want eventually to see a cram down where the courts may say, hey, you know, even though it didn't happen with Stockton, uh, but you saw some cases with Loyalton, uh, where the pension system and those who put in their time and earned their benefits uh, are gonna see some type of cram down. What's yeah, a cram I, I down? I wanna chime in, because, oh yeah, what's a cram down? Cram that? down is when you, when you force a, uh, a solution on them, right, to reduce what they're, what, what they're gonna receive. Right. Yeah, in my experience, I have not seen a tougher state political issue, and not just in California, though we, we have particular problems there, but so does Illinois. There are many states that have this pressure uh, than pension reform, because you're caught between two incredibly powerful political forces. You either sink more money into the pension fund, which by definition means other people get less. You take it out of education, you know, you, you, you raise taxes. I mean, a whole bunch of things of politicians, of course, because voters don't reward them for it, don't wanna face. And on the other hand, if you go and start cutting benefits, um, you know, as you well know, the voice of the public employee unions in California politics is very powerful. I don't care if it's the prison guards or the nurses or ask me whoever you, you know, which union you want to pick. So if you're a politician, particularly if you have to endure a democratic primary, which is the path to power in California and in Illinois for that matter, you, you kind of have to tell your most important political allies that I'm going to give you a big bad haircut. And they predictably say, hell no. And then you go to the Chamber of Commerce and say, hey, I'm going to raise everybody's taxes. Hell no. So it's become a vice where what happens is people just kick it down the can. There's some creative accounting. But, you know, we can't rely, particularly in a low interest environment like now, and I don't care about California anywhere, the idea that we're going to get six, seven percent returns on the pension fund to catch up. So it's one of these problems. The more we kick it down the can, and again, t tell me if you disagree, it gets worse. So yeah. it's something where the incentives in our political system are directly against the incentives to, frankly, give everybody a haircut, both more money in and less money out, which, you know, it's tough. And I don't know what that solution is. Yeah, as Mayor Garcetti used to say to me, he goes, John, you go down the proverbial ra rabbit hole in regards to going deep into answers where the, right, you're actually trying to solve solutions, right, the, uh, but you lose the answer, right? But you raised a great point, Mike, the, uh, right, with the Fed dropping the Fed funds rate, the, right, and a, a good portion of the uh, public pension portfolio being in bonds or fixed income, right. right, and then when you're seeing, instead of getting a three or 4% return, you're gonna get a one or 2% return, right, and the equity market returns dropping, trying to hit that hurdle of 7% uh, becomes more challenging. 
or yeah, you wind up in risky leverage stuff like private equity, which when it works, works great, but you're putting more risk into the system and, you know, chasing the illusion of 7%, you're, you're, you're buying risk to pay for that interest rate. So anyway, I don't know a single more vexing uh, thing. So let me, let me ask you a follow-up question on this. Let's pretend you weren't an elected politician, that aliens landed and said, you know, John, you no longer will ever have to be on the California ballot again. So this is hypothetical in case you want to run, but we're going to give you full power, you know, because we're going to suspend everything. What, what would your solution be? Not just California, but in any state with these kind of problems. What, what would your framework be if you didn't have to worry about the politics? Are you talking about pensions or are you talking about overall? Well, pensions, I would say. I mean, entitlements have many of the same problems, but I would say state employee and municipal pensions. Uh, part of this is we've risk shifted too much to the employee, but going forward with new employees, like the take, if we could have a lower discount rate, the sort of little bit of what Wisconsin has. So if you're underfunded for a particular year, there has to be ad additional contributions by all parties so that you're at the 100% uh, funded status. Got it. Okay. I agree. Okay. okay. Now, now I promise we're going to get off this and <laughs> Thank talk, you. A little bit more <laughs> talk a little bit more personally. Well, I didn't think there was anybody better to talk to, to, to a, uh, than, than you about this issue. Uh, but I'd like you to talk a little bit about your early life. Your parents came from Taiwan to the U.S. You've talked in interviews about their truly American story. Tell us about that story. And also, by the way, uh, we read somewhere that you and your brother were named after John and Robert Kennedy. Is that true? Oh, uh, yeah. They uh, incredibly blessed. I have sensational parents. Uh, unfortunately, my dad left this good earth in uh, 95. Uh, my mom, fortunately, uh, great new news, right, just turned 86 uh, last week and her cancer is uh, in remission. So the, uh, mm. they feel very happy she's, uh, she's with us. Um, the, they, they, like many others, just sacrificed. Uh, my dad left Taiwan, uh, so did my mom, separately in the 1950s. America was the land of great opportunities. Uh, it wasn't promised that it'd be easy. And in fact, it was an incredible struggle. My dad learned, uh, he started English in Taiwan, but learned his fifth language to get his PhD in chemical engineering, worked multiple jobs, uh, not much money, had three shirts, two pairs of pants. My mom scrubbed floors uh, at a junior college in South Dakota to pay for her English lessons. Uh, so they were just focused. Uh, they wanted the kid, their kids to be successful, uh, made uh, extraordinary sacrifices. Uh, so when we were growing up, the, even though my dad had a PhD, the, we weren't wealthy. So they were focused on our house, on good Chinese food that my mom made, the, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that we invested heavily in education. Uh, at some point, I think your at some point, I think your family moved to Chicago. We did. Uh, so when you were growing up, did you did you personally experience discrimination, and how has that shaped your politics? Sorry, Bob. I want to go back to the other question, the earlier question. Uh, that's you're more than welcome. Yeah. So the uh, I'm not named Richard. My dad won offered for name recognition uh, uh, recommendations that I be named after Richard. Uh, my mom won that battle, so I'm named John, and my brother's name is Robert. Right? Like a lot of immigrant parents of earlier generations, uh, they named their kids uh, after whoever occupied the White House. Right? In the old days, for a lot of immigrant families, they stick the the picture over, uh, you know, over the mantle of the of the fi fireplace. Uh, what's great about America is, like, as a child, I remember buying like that penny or nickel bust of John F. Kennedy. My childhood heroes were. John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, uh, Cesar Chavez. Uh, the, and I would have never imagined, I watched TV and I watched you know, President Kennedy fly into Hyannis Port, the family would play uh, touch football, and I was going, I always wanted to be there. Uh, one of the great blessings of life is I got to go there five times. Right? In fact, Ethel Kennedy invited me to stay at her house. I, uh, when my sister was murdered, Carrie Kennedy uh, went to my sister's funeral, right? And she was kneeling besides my mom and my brother, uh, Roger, right? Genuflecting, right? Good, good Catholic families. Um, and so, you know, that's, I went to John F. Kennedy's house, right? The, uh, just sat in the living room, just thinking, right? I, every child ought to have that opportunity. Uh, so when, uh, that, that's very moving. Uh, and I know what you're talking about because I spent a lot of time there over the years. Yeah. Uh, uh, we were talking, or I was about to try to get you to talk about when you moved to Chicago, growing up, uh, 
did you personally experience discrimination and how, how did that impact the way you thought about your life and about politics? Yeah, it was ugly. The, uh, I was five or six. It was the summer of my turning six when we went to uh, a community called Palos Heights. Back then, eight or 9,000 people, generally a lot of good people, but then so, a lot of racists uh, in that community. Um, I had a wonderful first grade teacher, Mrs. Elk, who actually kept in touch through, uh, with me until her passing. I remember uh, at a Democratic convention in, I think it was San Jose, but it was in Northern California, where her son came up and said, my mom's thinking about you. And she goes, I said, oh, who are you? Right? And goes, uh, my mom's Mrs. Elk. I said, oh, the first grade teacher who saved me. As, you know, as kids, you get taunted. Sometimes there's bullying. You get pushed around. As I got older, I got into physical fights to defend my brother, and it, I was conflicted, right? The, I had good friends who brought, whose brothers were taunting, you know, my brothers and my sister, and so I would get into fights. Uh, one time I got suspended from junior high school, and I finally got to play basketball, so I was suspended from playing basketball because a dear friend of mine's brother, on a daily basis, would stomp on my brother's lunch, and one time I just, Frank, you keep doing this, I'm going to beat you up, right? And he goes... He goes, uh, you know, then go ahead. And I beat him up. The, uh, I got pulled into the principal's office and they said, John, the, uh, they said, you know, you can't do that. I said, I know. And I was wrong. But I said, you guys got to do something, right? You're not stopping the bullying, right? And taunting of this. So, uh, you- and then in that community, uh, you know, it still faced discrimination, you know, just a, uh, a little over a decade ago. The uh, former mayor of my town, Palos Heights, won the John F. Kennedy Profiles and Courage Award because he stood up to some individuals who were taunting, uh, mocking Muslims uh, in that community. The, the Muslims wanted to buy a Christian church uh, for a place of worship, uh, and he lost his election. Right There, there was a lot of uh, discrimination, discriminatory practices taking place. Um, you know, what makes America great is our diversity. The, uh, we ought to celebrate it and understanding if we're smart about this, we could apply it to issues like COVID-19 uh, to move forward, right? We didn't learn from the Ebola experience. We should have learned from other experiences that this is a great advantage that the America has, especially if we want to prosper going forward. Uh, so how'd you get into politics? Uh, so I, w- I worked on Capitol Hill. Um, I was... I I sort of took notice early on. So when we were discriminated against, there was this Polish American city council member who stood up for mom. We would have ugly racial epithets spray painted on our garage. Kids would break windows. I used to add this story that, you know, our mailbox used to be blown up. But then my good friend, Deb, who actually lives nearby here in Culver City, and I get together like a few times a year with another friend, John Dravillis, who's Greek American, Right, and I didn't know it until just two years ago when John told me his family was discriminated against because they're Greek American. Uh, he said, "Oh yeah," he goes goes. My brother blew up mailbox, but it wasn't because you were Asian. It's just like you know he had this disease <laughs> to blow up mailbox. So, they, uh, you, know, you know, so they, uh, he, I eliminated. He was open minded about which mailboxes to blow yeah. up. It was not a yeah. <laughs> So you were going to talk about how you, how you got into politics. You, you said you were working on Capitol Hill. So I was excited about that. And I was ex- also excited about the uh, not having to play piano and, uh, and study in 1973 during the summers. I hated summer breaks because my mom used to make us study all the time. So she let us watch the Watergate hearings, right? And so I'm watching Sam Dash and Alexander Butterfield and John Dean. But I'm, as I'm watching the members of Congress, right, I'm thinking, Barbara Jordan, right? I'm watching Senator Inouye. I'm watching, well, the prosecutor, Sam Dash, Peter Rodino, uh, the being Catholic, loving baseball, Father Drynan, who I later took two classes from at uh, Georgetown. Father Drynan, I'm thinking, hey, that guy has like four or six degrees. It's problematic. He's a Red Sox fan. I'm a Yankees fan, right? The, but he's well-educated as a priest. The guy's going like, that's, that's something that's interesting. And then also that summer, the, I was always into civil rights. I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. So I, I, was started in, I was started in being interested in civil rights law and government and media. And so I was thinking, I want to do something in that space, much to the chagrin of my Asian mom who wanted me to be a surgeon. So uh, 
you become ultimately you become the controller of the state of California, and it's at a time when we're at the beginning of the Great Recession after the financial collapse in 2008. What what could the state do? What did you do to respond to that crisis? Yeah, so I I try to build sustainability into the system, uh, and. Bob and Mike, you guys are experts at this far more than I, right? Because you help strategize for the candidates. Power is the exercise, well, politics is the exercise of power. And the, I wanted to make sure that individual citizens, our democracy had the power instead of a handful. So I wanted to democratize and make accessible by providing transparency and accountability to the state's finances. Because whoever has that information has the power. So early on in office, I started posting the state's numbers, revenues, disbursements, cash position. Uh, I didn't know how it was valuable it was gonna be in 2007 until uh, I think it was July 13th. I said, hey, the numbers are reversing. The numbers are off, right? In fact, the state went into a negative cash position. I think if you're a business and you go into negative cash position or an individual family and go into a negative cash position, you need to, you need to be concerned, right? And it highlighted those issues. Another thing that I work on is I care about disaster recovery, business resumption. They, right, as the controller, we did 44 disbursement, 44 million disbursements a year, unclaimed property checks, refund checks, paying for essential government services. So I wanted to make sure that we built the capacity and Sacramento's in a floodplain, right? I didn't want to lose the payment processing functions. So I wanted to make sure that people had that information so that they could be protected. And that information became very, very valuable uh, to preparing school districts, healthcare providers, uh, the credit providers to the state of California with that information. And then it also forced the discussion with the legislature and the governor, right, bringing our uh, teams together to talk about why is the state's finances going, uh, going backwards. And how did you get along with the governor and the legislature? Uh, the, at the beginning, well, uh, at the, it, during the interim, uh, it was incredibly tense. Uh, I know one of the fellows this uh, semester is Mimi Walters. Uh, the, uh, I just wanted to give, send kudos to Mimi. The, uh, uh, I met with Mimi, and unlike a lot of uh, colleagues, Republican or Democrat, she didn't give me unnecessarily a hard time, right? The, when we started posting the numbers, so there were some Republican elected officials who would just give me a hard time, argue about the numbers. Uh, on my Council of Economic Advisors, I had eight PhDs uh, specialty. I said, go argue with the economists. The, uh, right, if you don't have a PhD and they're specialists, the, I think you better prep yourself. Uh, when I put out those numbers, Governor Schwarzenegger's office said, take those numbers down. We said, we're not going to take that number, those numbers down. It's important for people to have. But we'll tell the same thing to the legislature and we think the legislature will come to us. When we started posting those numbers, they engaged in those budget discussions. We got a contact from the, uh, the speaker's budget staff. They said, take those numbers down. We said, we anticipated this call. We told the governor three months ago, no. And we told him, when you guys asked, we said, no. Right? This is important public information about the state's financial health. And so controller, oh, go ahead, Bob. You got a no, no. Go ahead, Mike. Question. Go, go no, ahead. I can. You know, people. These titles are confusing. They hear state treasurer, which is a job you had later, but the the fiscal job, you know, other than the cabinet level governor's office, that has the power is controller. It's really the CFO of the state with some limitations. Um, and it was your first real big, I'm not really counting the Board of Equalization the same way, you know, elected office where you're both kind of a policy wonk and you're an elected politician. So, you know, from, from that experience in a powerful job in the biggest state in the country, what did you learn about politics and being an elected official that you didn't really know coming in? You know, what was kind of the big surprise? And I would say also, looking back, what do you think your biggest either error or mistake or, you know, teachable moment was? from that uh, career and that kind of job? So the, actually when you live it, you, you know it's coming, but actually to feel it, the, the elbows are sharper in the positions that have a, uh, where you have more fundamental power, right? The yeah. pe people will contest everything that you're stating. And as I always told individuals who challenged me, I said, I'm SEC liable, right? The, uh, right? 
the documents, the information that I put out is, subjects me to liability and the state to liability about the financial information we put out. So we are very judicious. We are very prudent about the information that we share. Yeah. Uh, I'll, give you an, I'll, give, I'll give you an example there. Uh, and, and he's a good man, but you know, I thought Abel Maldonado took a cheap shot. The, uh, right, the Steve Wesley started a program where we needed to upgrade our furniture in the controller's office, right? And then we were also moving from class A building to class B building to save rent, uh, right? And there was this famous Wall Street guy who spent a few million dollars, $2 million on a couple office chairs, right? So we were spending, I think, $6 million. It started during Steve Wesley uh, to move, I think, like 300 to 350 <coughs> people from class A to class B building to build like 300 units of modular furniture. And the attack was John Chung is like this other guy, Wall Street guy. He's spending $6 million on office furniture. I invited everybody to come in and look at the furniture that I had. <laughs> it was only well, five million. Oh, I'm kidding <laughs> you. Uh, and, and any mistakes, if you look back, that you learn from? You know, uh, I mean, that any anything that just you know, because I never met anybody in politics who doesn't look back and say, "Oh, that one I hadn't done it before," or something like that. I, I I've made uh, more than my <laughs> much we all? mistakes. Yeah, the uh, you know, part part of that is there's such demands on your attention it's it's building the relationships with the right people the uh but you know what's lacking from politics today is the the trust uh between the various parties between the various people the various principles and getting to know each other i try to spend a lot of time the uh, but the uh you know trying to catch up and learn the materials trying to build trust amongst your staff you know 99 percent of them are institutional staff right you bring right. very few of your new people so just i spend a lot of time internally uh so you know when we're going to try new things that i wouldn't i wouldn't lose staff right we were trying to upgrade in technology in the controller staff and a lot of the uh my staff members were fearful that they were going to lose the job i said no we will train you for new positions in fact you can get increased pay with that new skill set right but you get a lot of resistance for people who said you know, we don't, we, we don't want to do things differently. Yeah, I want to talk about you in the legislature, which we were talking about a while ago. Uh, in 2011, and it was quite famous, as controller, you halted the pay for state lawmakers after they failed to send a balanced budget to the governor's desk. How tense was that encounter? I made Jerry Brown very, very popular. The, uh, and so in a credit rating meeting, Bill Locke here said that Jerry Brown is the best politician he ever met in understanding vector analysis. So if you remember the, uh, a few days earlier, Jerry Brown in an unprecedented step vetoed a democratic legislature's budget. And so relationships between Governor Brown and the legislature were incredibly tense. The, I had supported Proposition 25 that said, right, reducing two thirds budget to a majority budget there's a constitutional provision that requires that you have a balanced budget, right? The budget that the legislature had passed was not balanced. So we said, hey, they didn't fulfill their constitutional responsibilities. We're not gonna pay them. Uh, <laughs> I was persona non grata. Uh, the, I was the least popular person in Sacramento, even though I had a whole bunch of legislators call me behind the scenes and they said, John, you did the right thing, right? Except that they couldn't say in public, and then the legislators who were close to me, the, even in public offense, they said, "John, we can't stand near you. Can't stand near you, right? Because the caucus said, you, right, you, the, uh, you, you're the enemy uh, now, right?'" But I, I was happy to do it. I, I just think we lost our way. And frankly, as a Democrat, uh, caring about the philosophy, my politics were the, you know, this state is fiscally moderate. We're socially progressive. If Democrats don't scoop on fiscal matters, right, we, we win the executive offices. We win the legislature. And so it's important not to screw up on fiscal matters. The, uh, and right, if, if we let it slide, the other things that we care about, whether it's, whether it's health care, whether it's education, whether it's child care, the, uh, whether it's building out infrastructure for disadvantaged communities, we're not going to get those opportunities you know, and we lost it during uh, when Governor Davis was recalled, right? When we screwed up with fiscal issues, 
the uh, right Governor Davis got hit with a surprise, right? And, and part of that is Governor Davis is such a sincere and good guy, right? The, uh, and I don't know, because I didn't have all the information where you place blame, but right, his, his staff shouldn't shock them like that, right? The, uh, and I wanted to make sure that our state wasn't hit like that. So when I didn't pay them, I became the enemy. Governor Brown got to go back and negotiate with the legislature and become the hero. And you got a balanced budget, right? And we got a balanced budget, right? That's one of those lessons learned. If you're going to hold office, you got to take the risk that makes that changes the culture in Sacramento, Washington, D.C. It's like draining bad habits. And the Democrats have endured long-time success, right? The over these years, because we've become also reasonably fiscally prudent in the eyes of the, in, in the of the voter voters. Yeah. Uh, so after you were controller, you went on to become California State Treasurer where people once again thought you did a spectacular job. And if you talk to any of the observers in Sacramento, the people who really follow things closely, they would say, that guy is first rate. You then ran for governor in uh, 2018 and it didn't work out. Why, why didn't that assessment of you uh, help you in that race or make a difference in that race? Yeah, I failed on a, a lot of fronts. Uh, well, part of it is my, my qualities, the, right, talking with Mike earlier, I think it's sort of uh, indicated as Amir, Amir Garcetti said, like the, uh, John's, you're into the rabbit hole, like great at coming up with solutions, but it doesn't translate into the average Californian's understanding. Like, you know, we increased by phenomenal percentages, the building and uh, refinancing of additional housing in the state. And we know we have a major crisis, right? But for voters to understand that, the, you know, when you have a fantastic accountant or when you have a fantastic investor with your money, right, the, uh, that oftentimes uh, gets lost. Secondly, the, I didn't communicate very well. And then, right, and then I probably couldn't win a race the way I govern. I spent a lot of time with the underserved. Or the, uh, I didn't spend a lot of time with the special interests, all right, their ability to influence elections and their ability to raise money. Right, because you have to you, you have to be dedicated to make sure you build a political apparatus that's successful. I liked governing, right? The, I viewed elections as something you had to do, right? And right, understand it, still recognizing that you're coming, that was huge. And also part of this is America's understanding of leadership. The right, I am a different face, a different background. Uh, when we did the polling, they said, you know, when we go over the stuff we did, they go, yeah, he's eminently qualified to do this, right? But part of this is Asians and leadership and media and all these other things. You know, as the son of immigrant parents, it's like once they hear the story, it's like, okay, they understand, right? But they don't immediately understand a Asians being sensitive to immigration issues or other people's struggle. So the, uh, right, it's an education that I have to keep pushing forward. And uh, it's not just an Asian issue, it's an American issue today. I'm yeah, ask look, uh, Go ahead, Mike. Don't beat yourself up because you also didn't have a real base. You know, California is so big. If you're a household name in the San Francisco media market, you're a mayor like Jerry was or Gavin, or you've got a big LA County base because you've been in local politics all the time and you're really, really well known. I mean, you're extremely well known by the 8% of the people who run the state and are a big part of the economy here, but it's just hard to crack a mega state without a huge voter base. Yeah, you know, just the just the way it is. Uh, I want I want to stay on politics, and I'm going to ask you about uh, the presidential race. But first, I've got one other COVID question. If I can go back to that, uh, if the federal government doesn't come up with another big COVID response bill that bails out states like California, what other options do we have? What happens then? Well, I think we're going to get something as long as we have uh, the Democrats uh, retaining the House of Representatives, right? As long as you have Nancy Pelosi in the negotiations, uh, you're going to get some, you're going to get assistance from California. You may not get the assistance. Uh, California's finances are heavily dependent on the occupant of the White House going forward. Are we going to get strong support, or are we going to get media, uh, uh, modest support uh, for California's recovery, right? And these expenditures are gonna be uh, incredibly dramatic. Uh, you know, the, so, and if you look going forward, uh, you know, Bob and Mike, you know this information better than I, the, you know, the, 
approval rating for the president that came out uh, yes, yesterday is 36% disapproval amongst independents in 60, 63 and the six major swing states he's, he's behind. Uh, so the question is, you know, can he, and that's a big question, right? Does he have the personal capacity to change, right? We saw a little bit, he actually wore a mask, right? But how quickly will he learn? Uh, will he learn from President Moon of South Korea? President Moon had terrible approval numbers, uh, not because of COVID, right? But they got worse because of COVID. Uh, he changed South Korea's strategy, had approval numbers that were over 70, right? He has other issues that have driven down his number down to 41%, right? But, you know, we need a coordinated response. We're looking to the commander in chief. He contains the platform. Uh, the question is also, can he turn around his reputation? That same poll said only 30% of the Americans trusted him on what he's saying in regards to COVID. Uh, and, and part of this is, does he, does he have an ounce of empathy in him? Uh, the mental health struggles, the, the entire struggles that Americans are undergoing today, the, uh, can he show that he's gonna fight for the American people, right? Americans are on the street trying to fix a health crisis, an economic crisis, and a moral crisis uh, the president has, has not demonstrated that he has the leadership capability to address those issues. So the question is, can he start to make improvements in any of those areas? Did you see that as likely? Uh, I see marginal improvement, the, uh, but not, not significant, right? And I, I, the, uh, I don't understand uh, because I'm not of that uh, construction. Uh, his base, right? And so how much room, how much space he has to move. Without uh, but he can't get reelected with that base because that base is probably 35, the hard base is probably 35, 38% of the vote. You know, when he's 15 points behind in one of the polls yesterday, you know, everybody keeps saying we got four months to go. But being 15 points behind in this polarized environment, this is not 1988 where people could say, Oh, I could be for Dukakis. I could be for for Bush. This is a people pretty much made up their minds. If fifty percent of people say they won't vote for him under any circumstances, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what he could do differently. I think if at the beginning of this crisis, the COVID crisis, he had called a press conference and said, uh, "This is a disease that doesn't discriminate between Democrats and Republicans. We don't know how bad it's going to get." I'm gonna call off my rallies for now. I'm gonna to go to the Oval Office. I'm gonna focus on this. Dr. Fauci will brief you every day. I think he'd be in pretty decent shape. The problem is he's Donald Trump. And it's almost as though he assumed the election was in April, not November. So I had to make sure that the economy was in great shape in April. Uh, so I, I don't myself know if he can change. Yeah, uh, I concur. Uh, I've got one other question and then I, I think we're gonna turn this to the audience. Uh, in an interview when you were running for governor, you talked about your, how your mother and father lived the American dream as you did earlier, that people who worked hard in America could get ahead. But then you observed that that might not be as true today as it was when they came to this country. Uh, that worries a lot of students who are watching us. In fact, the kids who graduated in 2020 clearly are facing a tough economy and, a, and tough prospects in terms of getting ahead. What should we be doing to get to the place where the American dream is real for everyone? Yeah, so in, in fact, it, it, is, uh, it is true, right? The, uh, our, our neighborhoods and communities look different, where you used to have greater integration across uh, the wealth spectrum in communities the, uh, and greater op shared opportunities. That's no longer true, right? You have more wealth concentrated wealthier communities. You have more concentrated low-income communities. Uh, the middle, in, uh, middle, uh, middle class is facing greater financial struggle. Uh, right? You'll look at studies, if you take a child from a lower income community, put them in a wealthier community, right? Th their opportunities expand and the performance closes dramatically for many of them uh, relative to a child of a wealthy family. But there are less opportunities. So how do we build a society? How do we build educational communities and other types of communities to create, to create uh, change in people's lives. And then if you look at uh, education, you could have somebody who's white and somebody who's black who's attained the same education, but you'll see different income 
outcomes. If you know, the you know people will talk about blacks who you know they're not saving. In fact, they are saving, but they they're oftentimes not saving in areas because they're buying cars, right? Because they need the transportation. Uh, so the right they have different assets that don't grow as quickly. Uh, and then we have this Gini coefficient, right? It's a disparity between the wealthy and poor, right? Our numbers are like China, they're terrible. This incredible wealth inequality. And if you look at successive generations, the, you, you have that next generation that's gonna inherit trillions of dollars of wealth, only exacerbating uh, the wealth disparity, right? So what do we do in regards to fixing the educational structure, making sure that we have jobs, right? The, the president, the governor, the legislature need to address those issues immediately. It's like, what are they, or the questions we ought to be asking our leaders, what are you doing today to build broadband connection? What are you doing to get more computers into middle and low income households so that these kids aren't falling behind? What are you doing to make sure that we protect our national grid in regards to electricity and manufacturing? Why aren't we getting college, community colleges educating people to build that broadband, to build the energy systems, to build that manufacturing? If we're gonna to try to get out of this healthcare crisis, do we have enough vials being built? Why aren't we getting the federal government to take more action to build more PPE facilities, right? You have a whole bunch of Americans and American capital that wanna invest in it, right? But we're not getting authorization from Washington, D.C. to do so. The, uh, and why aren't our government leaders, this is one of the things the we built all this, put all this investment over time, right? President Trump's America First policy is devastating in terms of American relationships. The, you know, we should be, I know the TECO, Taipei Economic and Cultural Organization, uh, through our Lieutenant Governor donated masks, right? The, why didn't we ask, you know, President Trump should ask President Xi, right, for the PPE, you know, we're getting a lot of bad products from China. Why don't you, since part of this is state control, why don't you guarantee those products for us, right? Instead of all of us have, and our, especially our healthcare providers and essential workers having to go through this upheaval. Yeah, uh, listen, John, I wanna just say the students who take your fellow seminar are gonna be very fortunate. And I'm very grateful that, and Mike and I are very grateful that you're coming. I'm gonna turn this over to Mike, uh, who's gonna take the questions that uh, our viewers have sent in. Mike? Thank you, Bob. And I'm going to start with a question of my own, just a quick one. I'm, I'm listening to you, and it's a good good pitch, particularly on the Democratic side. Are you thinking of running again? Uh, have you ruled out continuing a political career, or are you open to uh, serving again? The, it, it was an incredible honor to represent the people of the state of California. The uh, part, part of this is the I have great admiration, right? I grew up with public service being noble, and I wouldn't say no. Right, but the, I also see it hard to unravel my current life. The, uh, right, I'm invested in a lot of the work that I did in the treasurer's office, working for a financial firm, working for a healthcare firm, right? Actually executing models to try to reduce healthcare and expanding access. Um, the, there, there's limitations in government. The, uh, so the, if, if, I can, can, if I can make a meaningful difference in the private sector, I'll continue in the private sector. One of the things that I want to push is also, how do you create greater income? Uh, I have some friends that are working with Andrew Yang. You know, how do we, how do we take on privacy rights? Right? How do we stop these big conglomerates from taking people's information, using all that money for themselves, and giving some of that money back to individuals? And frankly, that's what governments ought to be thinking about. We need a bold, dynamic leader who's willing to be unpopular, like when I challenge the legislature, on that next step as to how do we have better healthcare outcomes and economic outcomes, right? And it's not popular, uh, even though other countries are doing it. And I'm working with some friends, I don't have a financial interest yet, but the, you know, testing and tracing, the, you know, how do we get more volunteers without having to make those phone calls, doing stuff like they do in Korea, Taiwan, elsewhere, without offend, offending too much the privacy rights of Americans. Great, okay, let's go to questions from our viewers. The first one comes from Anonymous. What would you have done differently in the recently passed state budget if you were governor? And so, I've got a heckler here, so I'm gonna quickly uh, deal with that while you answer. So I, I didn't track, 
I didn't track all the uh, technicals uh, on, on the state budget, so the, uh, I can't address all specific issues, but I, uh, mine would have been heavy on investments, right? It would have been heavy on job creation. And one of the, one of the things that's really important is how do we plan, because we're gonna have a massive crisis uh, after this, this is done. We, we have all these renters, and we, if you look at uh, this week's numbers, people who have mortgages who, who the, the rates of people who didn't pay increased by two or three percent. So what do we have in our plan to make sure that we protect individuals so that we don't have a greater housing crisis in the state of California? Uh, that, that's really important. And what do we do in regards to job creation? So that's the things that I would have focused on in the state budget. Another anonymous question, which I think is a really good one, what is your view on the long-term impact of the virus stimulus on the federal deficit and debt? Because in real dollars, we're spending almost as much on this than we did to win the Second World War. I mean, it's gonna be a big fiscal load going forward. Now you can debate how big and it's unavoidable, but it's big and Washington likes to pull the spending trigger. How do you think that's gonna work out in the medium term here? Yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna to have to work and be seriously financial disciplined and we're gonna to have to start paying that, that down. Uh, the reason we can borrow that much and we get international investors is right, the rule of law in the United States of America. Uh, you know that you're gonna get a return. Uh, the, but if, if this happens and we have massive debt, if we have any downgrading, right, the cost of borrowing is gonna be much more expensive. Uh, we saw through international flows of capital that a lot more international investors, instead of putting their money in the United States, I think it was the month of May, decided to put their money in fixed income in China, right? So they're starting to see alternatives, meaning that they're going to move that money to China or elsewhere, our cost of borrowing is going to be more expensive. So that we're going to, we're going to really have to focus on making, paying down. And then, right, you have a Republican pollster who said, actually, right, there is, an, there is a willingness by Republicans and conservatives to pay additional taxes. Right? So we're gonna to have to be disciplined about making sure we get job, more job creation, greater revenues, use those dollars to uh, reignite the economy, but also pay down debt. Yeah, I worry about that reserve currency issue because we get away with a lot of fiscal um, murder because we're the reserve currency. And if we have an election with a lot of vote by mail because of COVID, and it takes 10 days to count the vote and the president goes crazy on institutions like a banana republic, the economic impact could be tremendous on our ability to get cut all that slack on debt, which I don't think people understand, but it's a huge risk. Uh, another question from Anonymous. Oh, go ahead if you have a point, sure. There's states that are begging the federal government that they don't have the finances today to pay for the expanded capacity they need to vote, right? So the, uh, right, right. Your, your point's a great one. And, and Trump's gonna go institutional and it, it, it is a, it's a real systemic threat uh, to our, our, our ability to have the fiscal leverage we have now. Um, so another anonymous question, what can, uh, close to my heart here, but this was not me, what can be done to counterbalance the public employee union's lopsided power to better align policy with the interests of the overall general public? Because we all know working in California government, man, I remember when I was working for Arnold, we would have, and you know well, the big five meetings with the four legislative leaders, two from each party, Democrats and majority, they try to close budget deals. And the speaker back then would have to call the state teachers union to find out what to order for lunch. Arnold used to say, you know, send him out, send her in. Um, so what do we do about that? Because they are massively powerful. You don't want to face them in a democratic primary but it forces policymakers to essentially negotiate with their political bosses that have so much influence over them. And it's a, it, it really makes it sticky. Is there a systemic reform or something people ought to look at? They're powerful, but there's other interests that, that are powerful. Part of this is the, uh, right, they used to call me a maverick on a, a lot of those issues. Mine is just keeping straight and over a period of time, right, you build the will. One of the things that we talked about pensions, one of the things that made me unpopular is that uh, I did an accounting study on our healthcare obligations called OPEB, Other Post-Employee Benefits. Uh, and that was incredibly unpopular. But then when you get a leader like Jerry Brown, 
right? He gets people to the table and said, we're not gonna move on this issue uh, until we start to get solutions, right? So you, you need strong, you need a governor who's willing to take, and legislature who's willing to take it on. Uh, here's a question from Christian Foster. Why couldn't the federal government offer an incentive, such as an uh, exception from the income tax for a year, to induce baby boomers like Bob to early retirement? <laughs> Wouldn't that keep numbers down on company layoffs and perhaps a need of openings for recent grants to fill those jobs? Private industry has been doing packages like this for a long time. And the city of LA, I believe, has offered incentives concurrently for early retirement of city employees. I haven't heard of any such discussions regarding stimulus plans. And so I'm wondering why not and or is this not a feasible plan? I, think, I don't think it's a good plan. The, uh, the, uh, you know, we have demographic challenges the, uh, and, and it's also a personal philosophy. America needs to grow its productivity, right? The, we talk about unemployment numbers and, you know, President Trump trumpeted the, uh, the number, you know, how many people were rehired, uh, dropping, but we have a lot of people out of the workforce, right? We need as many productive people. And even if Bob is informally working, uh, we need those of us, our generations who are baby boom, right? Meaningfully involved in our community, sharing our knowledge. We have major issues. Uh, America's fallen behind in, it's like not only 5G, right? The, I have a friend who goes to a Chinese university for executive MBA. The Chinese are working on 6G and America's not ready for 5G, right? So to displace people who have that technical expertise is devastating. We need to work on hypersonic activity. We need to work on space activity, right? Others, the uh, Russia just improved its triage capacity and upgraded their nuclear capacity, right? These are issues America needs to work on. And then from a moral perspective, the, you know, my mom loves America, but she had major issues. She said, this country doesn't respect the elders, right? The, unlike where they did. It's like people who sacrificed, who imparted knowledge, who are giving their very best to the next generation, right? To discard everything that we have and what we've given uh, is disrespectful. And I share that feeling. Excellent. Okay, from Anonymous, Anonymous's cousin, the other Anonymous. Are you concerned about the degree, and this is close to our hearts at the uh, USC Center for the Political Future, are you concerned about the degree of tribalism and partisanship in politics today? How do you personally bridge divides with people who are wrong or offensive or worse? How do you institutionally resolve this deep social division? Yeah, the uh, part of this is uh, recognizing that we have differences, but that we have a greater purpose uh, I got along with uh, most of my Republican colleagues. In fact, I had a Republican colleague who wanted to overthrow another Republican colleague as chair and put me in. He goes, he said, John, the, uh, we may not disagree, uh, we may not agree a lot. He goes, you're honest with me. The, uh, right, the, if you're gonna vote with me, you tell me. If you're not gonna vote with me. But this is when you were in the legislature. Th this is when I was at the Board of Equalization. The Board of Equalization, okay. The, uh, so the, and, and, and part of this is, you know, we have to come together to work on these things. And, and, and it's, uh, it's not easy, but we have to understand that if we're divided, we're going to continue to fall behind. We need, we need America's best at this, at this very time. So Diane Watson writes, as a career educator, I am concerned about the efforts to provide online education uh, and the protection efforts when students and teachers return to school. We don't really know at least in LA County, when that'll be. The online teaching was not consistent in the spring. Have you given some thought about how much these efforts will cost school districts? Well, if, if it's the Diane Watson, a love to our ambassador and congresswoman and uh, legislator who is the incredibly committed, uh, an ex extraordinary model, being active during service and after service. Th this is gonna have, tremendous impacts the, uh, on edu educational attainment, right? The, we need to make sure that we implement best practices uh, going forward. I know the, uh, I, I shared with Harry, right? They're starting to talk about virtual reality and artificial, uh, the, uh, it's, it escapes my, the, my thought process right now, what the term is, right? But the- we, Artificial we, intelligence. 
the it's, it's not artificial intelligence. It's, it's uh, I forgot what it is. Okay. Uh, right. But th those practices of how we deeply connect uh, with individuals, the uh, to make sure that the the, the students get the uh, education right. So part of this transformation is you know are our government leaders thinking about the schedules coordinated between the business community and the education community, right? What can we do to bring teachers to uh, and others who can provide assistance to, to the students? The, you know, can we do some, instead of doing 100% of the in-person education, can we drop it to 10 to 20% where, you know, you do some online, but you can do some reinforcement in person, right? What are those various alternatives, right, that other countries are, are exploring, starting to implement, learning from them and see uh, what we can do here. Uh, Anonymous wants to know, what is your view on unemployment benefits running out at the end of the month? And which national leaders today inspire you and why? So it's, uh, if those unemployment benefits expire, we're gonna have uh, greater mental health issues, we're gonna have greater financial peril, we're gonna have, greater, uh, we're gonna have more profound uh, dislocation, uh, in regards to housing uh, and engagement, uh, right? Part, part of this is we need to figure out how to integrate people uh, in regards to getting education and gets the essential jobs at this period of time. So, you know, as, as I referenced earlier, you know, the uh, essential infrastructure that we need to build out, what can we do to tie community college education and other programs so that people can have meaningful employment? Uh, ben Wong wants to know, isn't it true you got your early start in politics running for student body office in high school? And wasn't Dave Jones, former California insurance, insurance commissioner, your high school classmate? Yeah, I love, love Ben Wong, who's another former terrific uh, elected official. He also was a highly high performing and capable staff member of mine when I was at the, uh, the Board of Equalization. Uh, so Dave and I went to high school together. He was student body president. I was student body vice president. He's a terrific and dear friend. Uh, and and he, he, he's just a great safety blanket. The, I, I don't know why people challenge you, right? When I mentioned some of the discrimination my family faced, the, uh, you know, people would always say, no, that doesn't happen to Asians. That's not real, right? And Dave would just say, you know, not only was it real, it was bad. Right, the uh, you know ju just trying to go to school and people trying to start fights, just trying to have to defend our honor and the values. So uh, the uh, and I just and in fact, D Dave's uh, one of my favorite public servants. He's not federal, the uh, and no longer in office, but he has a great Midwestern work ethic. Right, he just he puts in the hours. He's sharp. He works really hard. He he cares about people. My, I tell people my my view, what I like about elected officials are like serious, thoughtful people of goodwill who are responsible, right? I want those elements in my elected officials. Well, that is an excellent question to end on. John Chung, thank you so much for joining us. Can I say one second? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, you get, to, you get to bring us home here. What do you got? Uh, the, this is a sensational program, right? The, I hired, uh, and the Dornsife School is fantastic. In fact, as a public servant and campaigning, I hired two graduates, not from the center, but from Dornsife. My chief of staff who led us uh, through a lot of these challenges is a graduate, Colin Wong Martinezson. Uh, now works for the University of California, handling technology transfers, and works for the chair of the board, John Perez, on critical issues. And Alexandra was my star fundraiser. Uh, she also demonstrates the goodwill, right? She and her friend were uh, making masks for their neighbors during this crisis. Uh, so, right, that's, that's what you get from uh, this program at USC. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's a classy operation here, and Shrum and I have to work every day not to bring it down <laughs> um, with, our, with our cynical, practical, political outlet. But look, if there's folks watching, you can find out a lot more about the center, which I'm sure many of you already do at our website, or you can follow us on Twitter, we're on social media. And we're gonna be back in August uh, talking about Bob and I with an election R&D talking about the National Political Convention. So thank you so much for joining us. And remember, John Chung will be one of our fellows coming forward so you can check in on his 
his course and learn a lot about fiscal policy during times of stress from somebody who just doesn't have an opinion about it, but was there in the trenches at the highest possible level. So thank you for joining us today. And Bob and I will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.